Hello and welcome to Good Morning UK Have Your Say, a Force for Goods mid-morning show coming to you live from our nerve centre here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow. With me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. And this is the show where we're British, we love the United Kingdom, and we want to stay together. And we've billed today's episode as the wholesome alternative to Good Morning Britain, which is our main rival for viewers on a Wednesday morning. At least that's what we'd like to think and if you have seen Good Morning Britain, and I do not advise you to do so, it's as a consequence of that awful programme that we decided to set up our wholesome, more truthful version of it. Because goodness knows the country absolutely needs it. And I've got a lot to talk about this morning on those matters. We're going to be talking about what's happening with vaccine passports, which is all in the news at the moment. And unlike Good Morning Britain, we're not going to be promoting such. We're going to be talking about, of course, our United Kingdom and how to keep it together. And that's going to be a big part of the show as well, because I've some important news that I want to tell you about that. Well, some of you will know that A Force for Good was out on Saturday, we had a crack team of six of us who went out to meet and greet the Scottish nationalists who were marching in their, I won't say hundreds, I won't say scores, I won't even say tens. They were marching in their ones, um, largely out of sight and out of mind of the great British public, I'm glad to say. Although there was a little bit of the route where they came onto Argyle Street and where the people were, and we were there twice to say hello at the corner of Queen Street and Argyle Street, and then when they passed us at the corner of Glassford Street when they came round again. And some of you will have seen the video. I'm going to play the video for you just now. Now, bear in mind, there was about 30 of them and we knew it was going to be a very small demo, so we knew it was going to pass literally in a matter of seconds. So that's why we didn't make a big thing of it. We weren't inviting people from all around to come and join us, because that would just have been largely a waste of time. So we got a few folk that we know here in Glasgow, based around the city centre, and we said, hey, let's come out and um, and let's uh, let's do this. And let's just keep the British end up, which is the important thing and let's just fly some Union Jacks while they're passing just so that they know that their point of view is not the only point of view and as David says if their march on Saturday is anything to go by then their indie dream is well and truly dead indeed that was the uh, the Scottish Nationalist March I hope you didn't blink and miss it and there was 30 there including somebody who wants to be me You'll have noticed him dancing around there with a Union Jack t-shirt on. All good fun at the end of the day. I certainly don't mind that. But that's had quite a few thousand views already on our new TikTok page and on our Instagram page and on Facebook and YouTube. And it's good just to just to do that uh, and just to keep keep the flag flying, as it were. And whenever they do something, we do something, you know, if it's appropriate for us to do. We've got another video of that incident, of that, of that event, um, which we'll put on our TikTok uh, later this afternoon. And that's a video from the other end of Argyle Street when they came round and when they passed us again. So that was some good activism out on the streets, just standing up for for the United Kingdom there. And something that's very interesting is I was watching their live feed because they did a live feed as well. And I noticed just as they came over the Clyde Arc, I noticed that there was what looked like a builder. He had his yellow vest and a helmet on and he was holding a Union Jack and you just glimpsed him in the corner of their live feed. So what I did was I just screenshotted that and I put it up on our Facebook page and it got over one 
1,100 likes. And I'll just share that picture with you. And what this says to me is people really liked the idea of simply somebody, somebody, see that's, it's a very, very small picture. Sorry about that, but that's the best I can do. But see that chap, see the Union Jack there? That picture, and it's just a bloody picture from a live feed, got over 1,100 views and reached 18,000, sorry, 1,100 likes and reached over 18,000 people. So what that says is people like to see that sort of individual initiative, you know, and anybody can do it. And that was just one chap there with a Union Jack. And if I had not spotted him there on the live feed, very few people would have known that he had even done that. So another lesson is if you're going to do something, always have somebody who can take a photograph of you and put it up on Twitter or Facebook or send it to somebody such as ourselves who can use it and get it out to potentially millions of people. And somebody else pointed out that they keep a Union Jack in their car for rapid deployment. So if they ever see the uh, a point where they should be pulling it out and waving it, then they've got it already in the glove compartment. And so that just shows the importance of having your Union Jack ready to hand, such as this right here. And we actually sell this. These are custom made Union Jacks that we have that you'll get in our shop. And they've got uh, an open hem, so you can actually put uh, a cane or a stick or whatever into the open hem and tie it with that little, little tie. So these are quality, quality Union Jacks. And they're only three ninety nine, including postage from our shop. But every Patriot should have at least one, if not two, one to keep in your car for rapid deployment. If you want to join our activism, please do. Now, I have a question for everybody today. I'm looking for ideas to keep the United Kingdom together. Please send them in. Now, we are publishing a 36-page copy of our magazine Union Heart, which will be our autumn edition. And that is going to be a special policy edition. And each page is going to be devoted to policies, ideas to keep the United Kingdom together. Okay. And I'm more to speak about that because I'm going to have to take some time specifically to write that. But I'll be telling you about that later in the program. But if you've got ideas, send them in. Send them into the program just now or send them in to us at any time for us to consider. And they can just be wee ideas or big ideas. OK, it can be about building bridges or it can be about flying a flag from a particular building. Anything that you think can help to keep the UK together, please send them in because we're going to put these together in a magazine and then we are going to make sure that magazine gets to the opinion formers and the legislators and the people who need to know about these things. But we've decided just let's bring it all together into one amazing document, full colour, 36-page magazine on keeping the United kingdom together and the working title is do more together that's the working title because that's how you build a union a political social cultural familial whatever it's do more together and you bond that way so that's the working title of our amazing magazine which is coming up in the latter part of this year in the autumn of this year. So if you've any ideas to keep the United Kingdom together, please send them in. Well, J Jonathan talks there about the idea of a Team GB football team. There's a, a, a women's football team, but not a men's football team. Um, I don't know the politics of that, but I, I know it will be something to do with the absolutely awful football associations that we have in the United Kingdom and they all fight each other and they're all against that idea because they all think wrongly that somehow it's going to take away from their importance as the Scottish FA or as the English FA 
or things like that. In fact, the Scottish FA is actually the worst for that. Um, uh, they're the worst for that because um, they think it's somehow going to mean that there'll never be a Team Scotland anymore. It'll just be Team GB. What ignorance, what utter arrogant ignorance of these fools who run the SFA. Of course it's not going to be that. It's just a, a Team GB for the purposes of the Olympics. But these football associations are far too up themselves to be able to widen the idea out into a pan-British. Thankfully, the women's football team doesn't have that stupid mentality. Um, that's that's the reason for that, Jonathan. And of course, buying British produce whenever we can. Absolutely. That's something that everybody can do, Tommy. All of us have a limited ability to affect the world around us. But one of the things that we can do is make sure that we spend our money appropriately, that we spend our money on things that we want more of. Because if you spend your money on, on things like that, you'll get more of it. You know, if you like it, uh, spend money on it and you'll get more of it. So if you want more British produce, spend money on British produce. Absolutely. That's, that's a very simple one, but it's something that we can all do. Well, Adam says there, and I'll just answer this quickly. What's your opinion of the SNP under investigation for potential fraud? We're not expending any energy on that because we don't believe that there is fraud there. What they'll have done is they'll have spent that six hundred thousand pounds, and um, but they will, and and that will have been written somehow into the 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 contract, as it were, when people gave them that money for a referendum campaign. So I don't see anything coming of that. It's not something that we're going to expend any energy on. Um, pretty certain there won't have been that degree of fraud. We might be proved wrong on that, but I think that's just uh, just creative accounting, which is not going to be proven to be illegal. Just talking uh, on the matter of of the Scottish National Party at the moment, I read an article that appeared in the Daily Telegraph this week, and written by a sensible chap called James Melville, and well, it was actually uh, uh, t- about ten days ago, eleventh of. July and he was talking about how he would be cheering on England. He's a Scot who's cheering on England. Fantastic as of course if you're British it's a natural thing to want to do. But then he dropped a bomb on us here and he said that he supported Scottish independence which we didn't, which we were certainly disappointed to hear. And then he tells us that in fact he lives in England now and he's made England his home and that that then began to make some kind of sense to us because there are, there are a certain number of Scots who live in the rest of the United Kingdom who have who are who have sort of how shall I say this um, got a romantic view of Scotland that now that they're away from it and so they're not actually living in it and knowing what it's going through and knowing the dangers of what separation would bring in their uh, living in England. They imagine that it's somehow going to be rosy. And this is what just kind of irritated me about his reason for it. And, and I'm just going to uh, tell him why he's wrong. He said, Britain, inverted commas, in my mind, should be a social and cultural phenomenon rather than a political unit. Well, we've had that argument, of course, since uh, we started to do this all these almost 10 years ago now. And our point is that the social and cultural elements of Britishness depend upon political connections. You take away the political connection and the social and cultural elements of Britishness and of Britain will no longer exist, okay? And we always use the example, if you don't believe us, try going to the Republic of Ireland and fly in a Union Jack and see how much your Britishness gets you there, okay? It's not going to work for you. So if you break down the British political unit, the social and cultural connections start to collapse as well. The social and cultural connections follow from Britain being a political unit. And we wrote an article on that about the social and cultural bonds flowing from the political unit. And we'll put 
that article up in the comments right now. But um, so if that was his reason, it's just an airy fairy reason that's not based upon a proper understanding of the political reality. Social and cultural Britishness flows from the fact that we are politically connected in some way. It doesn't. It's not the other way around. And you take away the political con connections and the social and cultural bonds will start to fray and the shutters, as we always say, will come down. OK, so Mr Melville, you write some good stuff on Twitter, especially regarding the COVID carry on. But I'm afraid you're a wee bit off the mark on that particular matter. Now, Pauline says here, there was an article on the state-owned airport Prestwick, just like our roads, the runways are breaking up. Footage emerged of an aircraft taking off, leaving behind a huge amount of debris after the runway broke apart. Goodness sake. Goodness sake. And of course, Ibrox Park is correct about the Northern Ireland protocol. Lorry loads of food getting turned away from, from the United Kingdom at Belfast and Larne ports. And that is something that does have to be scrapped. Uh, uh, let us hope and pray for imagination and wisdom in our political leaders that they see the folly of the protocol and that they stand up against the EU and that they do scrap it, Ibrox Park. A, a very good point there, a very good point. But, you know, it's been a, it's been a concern ever since John Major's government said that... Um, remember that horrible phrase he came up with I've got it over here, hang on he said that Westminster had no quote, selfish strategic or economic interest in Northern Ireland, which was just a terrible, terrible thing that he said, and of course that was to appease the IRA, and in many ways the British government has been working from that which is not a unionist position at all, um, it's 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 not in any way connected with anything or anybody who believes in the concept of the union and um, that just goes to show the extent to which many of the politicians back then at Westminster just had no thought for the union no thought on how to keep it together no thought even of what it was they were just they they weren't operating from any kind of um british political ideology they were just time servers who had somehow got into the establishment and didn't did, had no regard for any kind of ideology of uh, Britishness or ideology of union. Oh my goodness me, that's just terrible when you think about that. And even Margaret Thatcher, whatever you think about her, some of her comments on the union were a bit iffy as well, not from a strong unionist position. Um, certainly not one that we would recognise as unionist today. Anyway, enough of that. Um, hopefully our political class today is coming to understand the importance of unionist ideology in a way that back in Major's Day there was no conception of. Basically no books had been written on it and there was no groups like A Force for Good trying to educate them about what unionist philosophy was. Let's talk about on this day in British history. On this day in British history, um, a man passed away who was, of course, a legend on the 21st of July, 1796. Robert Burns died. He passed away in Dumfries, and he was buried with full military honours on the 25th of July in St Michael's Churchyard in Dumfries. And his corpse was clothed in the uniform of the Royal Dumfries Volunteers, hence the full military honours at his funeral. Not many people know that he served in the Royal Dumfries Volunteers. And, and indeed, he wrote a very patriotically British poem called The Dumfries Volunteers. And uh, let me just bring up that, let me bring up that poem because it's, it's really quite brilliant. Oh, let us not 
and he's talking to the British here. Oh, let us not, like snarling curs in wrangling, be divided. And then he goes on and he says, be Britain still to Britain true, among ourselves united, for never but by British hands must British wrongs be righted. That's brilliant. Never but by British hands must British wrongs be righted. And then he also goes on and he says, Who would set the mob about the throne? May they be damned together. Who will not sing God save the king shall hang as high as the steeple. <laughs> but And then he adds, But while we sing God save the king, we'll never forget the people. While we sing God save the king, we'll never forget the people. So something for everybody in that poem. I think it's a great one. But I always love the line, be Britain still to Britain true, among ourselves united. For never but by British hands shall British wrongs be righted. And that's so true today. That's like the motto almost for unionism. Oh, let us not like snarling curs in wrangling be divided. For stay true to Britain and sort out our problems among ourselves. A great piece of unionist Philosophy, And we wrote an article about Robert Burns and his sense of Britishness on our legacy site. And we'll put that article up there as well for those who would like to read it. So that was Robert Burns who passed away on this day in, in uh, 1796. Also on this day, 21st of July, 1982... The flagship of the British task force made her victorious return to Portsmouth after the Falklands War. And that was HMS Hermes returned to Portsmouth. Um, to much acclaim, to much acclaim, a ship that had been built in 1953. And have I got a, a picture of that? I'll see if I've got a, a picture of HMS Hermes returning victorious to. That's what I wanted to talk about now is the, the vaccine passport carry on because I've got, oh, Pauline says RF means royal family. Indeed, um, can they do more specifically for the union? Um, they've got to, they've got to toe a careful line, obviously, but just simply being around and being uh, a presence and being a uniting presence in and of itself has a very powerful effect. They don't need to get into advocating politics. They just need to be there. They need to be seen and uh, wherever they are, if they're surrounded by the paraphernalia and the flags and the symbols of Britishness, then that alone is a very, very powerful thing that they can do. Uh, and, a, and a uniting thing that they can do as well. And that's why they're so important to the maintenance of the union. And one of the reasons why many in the Scottish Nationalists want to get rid of them, even though Scotland, of course, has been a monarchy longer even than England. And indeed, arguably, even during the the, the Cromwellian period, Scotland had decreed that Charles II was the king, even though that had not been decreed in, in England. So Scotland's always been a monarchy and it's part of who we are. And it's about educating the Scottish nationalists to see that as well. But um, good point there, Pauline. Thanks, thanks, for bringing, thanks for bringing that up. Ibrox says the Canberra which was built in Harland and Wolfe in Belfast, returned also safe and sound. Thank goodness. Thank goodness that it did. Um, yeah, so what we've got here uh, this week, we had Freedom Day in England. Freedom Day in Scotland's never coming, by the way. I don't want to depress you about that, but it's never coming. But at least they pretended they had a Freedom Day in England. And that was on Monday. But what was very interesting psychologically to me was on the very same day that they had a Freedom Day, Boris Johnston announced that if you wanted to get into a nightclub, then you would have to have a vaccine p 
passport. Now note the word nightclub, okay? For most people in Britain, they never go to nightclubs, okay? So most people don't care, unfortunately, that you have to get a vaccine passport to get into a nightclub that 18 year olds to whatever age are going to be at because they're not doing that. Most people don't care about that. So unfortunately, they probably will have no sympathy one way or the other. So he said that in order that most people wouldn't have any sympathy in the first place. But he also said that word nightclub in order to direct, to direct attention towards that cohort, that age group that do go to nightclubs because for some twisted reason the western world's population want to vaccinate everybody for a disease that we has a 99.7% chance of recovery from and which is not dangerous to people under the age of 50 unless they have serious pre-existing conditions OK, so he said that word nightclub so that most people would switch off. Oh, I don't go to a nightclub anyway. Why should I care? And he also said the word nightclub in order specifically to direct his message to those people who do go, which is your 18 year old plus cohort. But don't think that's not going to be extended out because he also put in other crowded venues. Now, what is a crowded venue these days? That could be a restaurant, that could be a pub, that could be your local social club, that could be a football game, obviously, a any kind of sports activity, that could be a church, church service, anything like that. These are all just potentially crowded places. And so he was, he and the system, okay, because it's not just him, it's he's just a kind of cog at the end of the day, is just driving this for everybody to get these uh, jags. Now, I'm speaking as one who's never had it and will never have it, and I know that's just a small percentage of us, but to those who have had it, I would ask, I would suggest that you don't uh, fall for this passport, this uh, passport thing, because that passport in itself is going to have to be renewable. And that passport itself will depend upon you getting further jags in order to keep it, uh, in order to keep it a fresh passport. Okay, so um, what we can only hope is that in time, political forces are going to arise that will put an end to this. But don't think that by getting the jab, you're going to have your freedom because that passport will be contingent upon you getting further ones each year, whether that's every 12 months or every six months or whatever. So you'll not break out of it any more than I'm going to at the end of the day. Okay, so don't, uh, don't fall for it because it's going to be something that has to be renewed every six months anyway. Um, so there's that. There, there's that. Uh, to, 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 to talk about but it's it's it should also be as I've always said it should be separated this sense of the vaccine should be separated from uh, vaccines that you need to have because a disease is very dangerous such as diphtheria or malaria or 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 whatever you know these are diseases that will kill you if you catch them um, but this is not and so if you're a young person you don't need it and if you're a child you definitely don't need it so why are they doing this why are they pushing it on people who don't need it and the only explanation i can come up with is that the politicians have got themselves stuck into a situation uh, where there's so much pressure from other politicians so much pressure from the media and so much pressure from uh, teachers and nurses unions that they basically can't get out of it without a advocating that everybody has the jab. It's, it's they've got themselves into a, a treadmill, as it were, that they cannot see a way out of. 
uh, without uh, going through the, the vaccine system. But the whole thing is a holy mess of the first order for something that's got a 99.7% chance of recovery. So it's the best thing to do is just try to stay out of this at the moment. Don't go along with what they're telling you to do if you can avoid it. Don't go along with it because there's there's no freedom in the way that they're they're pretending that's going to be not for you, not for me, not for anybody. So you may as well just back out of it and just uh, and just see what happens. See what happens. See if political forces arise that can somehow put an end to this. And we have to hope, and we have to hope and pray that that will be the case. And I always give a, a, a wee plug to this book, A State of Fear, by Laura Dodsworth, who shows how the state, whether that's Boris in England or whether it's Sturgeon, especially here in Scotland, is weaponizing fear using what's called behavioural science in order to lead people in particular ways. And she calls it nudging, uh, which is the behavioural science term for it. Boris wants to nudge 18-year-olds to get the vaccine. So what he says is they can't get into a nightclub unless they've had the vaccine. That's called a nudge. So I'm saying to 18-year-olds, don't fall for that, because once you go down that route, you'll be on an endless hamster wheel of more and more vaccinations, because your vaccine passport will be contingent upon the latest one that you've had. So just avoid that, and let's just hope that political powers will arise that will be able to stop this somehow. Because there's no end to what Boris is advocating, and there's no end to... to to constant lockdowns because because all the words have been redefined and misdefined the language that has been the language that is used is a language of perpetual lockdown because they're, they're doing the testing more and more healthy people they find these cases among healthy people they call these cases infections and they scare you that these perfectly healthy people are somehow infected like something from, you know, a zombie movie or something like that. No, these are just healthy people, but they're calling them cases and they're equating cases with infections. Well, if you do that, there's no end. There's no end to this. There's no end to this, if that's how you define the words. So this lady obviously understands all that very well. And at the end of the day, she, she gives three things that we can do at the moment when faced with this is firstly, understand the sort of things that I've just said to you. She calls it uncover. OK, uncover the uh, the language, uncover what's going on. S try to see what's going on. If you can being aware that the government is using fear to manipulate you is the first step towards spotting and resisting manipulation. And this lady is not coming from any kind of political point of view or whatever, but she's just pointing these sorts of things out. Make your decisions as much as possible in private is another thing as well, because conformity is reduced when decisions are made in private. So make an effort to make important decisions away from prying eyes. Two, something that I absolutely advocate is unplug, by which she means switch off the scare machine, switch off Good Morning Britain, switch off anything that is terrorising you or your family. And that is, at this moment, that's the entire mainstream media. Although it's very difficult to do that and as she acknowledges sometimes your mind can still be influenced but the best tactic is simply to avoid avoid listening to those those people and the third one she says is uplift uplift your mind uplift your consciousness uplift your spirit 
To avoid being manipulated by the news, she says, be sure to avoid consuming the information when you are tired, hungry, stressed or distracted. Similarly, reduce decision fatigue by minimising the amount of inconsequential choices you have to make and avoid being overwhelmed with information. Limiting, limiting emotional overstimulation will make you less prone to emotional thinking. And she has this really good line here. In fact, she's actually quoting somebody here. She's quoting somebody. Ultimately, the goal is to give your brain room to think by reducing chaos in your life. Reducing chaos in your life. That's a good way of putting it. Give your brain room to think by reducing chaos in your life. That's so necessary right now. So necessary. Bill says, you must be a big reader, always sharing books, a man of knowledge. Well, thank you, Bill. We do our best. If we've got, if there's books that say something that's really valuable, we'll, we'll try to give them, we'll try to give them a mention. And Pauline says, yes, our politicians have cornered themselves. Absolutely cornered themselves. And, you know, I'm not having a go. We're all to blame here. I mean, I see unionists uh, attacking Sturgeon because of case rising they shouldn't be doing that you know because ca the, the cases are not infections so why is, are you as a unionist attacking Nicholas Sturgeon because cases are rising when you should know cases are not infections cases are just very often false positives anyway cases are abs actually as they're as they have become to be defined, are actually irrelevant. Um, and if we, we, somebody said we're suffering from a case pandemic, a case demic, that's what we've got, a case demic. And so long as you call a case an infection, then you're never going to get out of it when a case is actually a healthy person. Um, so it can change, it can change, but we need the politicians to stop going along with all this false rhetoric politicians on all sides we're holding them all to blame here unionists and nationalists alike for trying to score points off each other when all we have is a case-demic although things might be changing things might be changing I noticed this now uh, yesterday in the Times they had an article do you have mask mouth? Big article in the Times about the dangers of wearing a mask. <laughs> this was yesterday. Now, they've only felt free to actually uh, publish that as a consequence of so-called Freedom Day in England. Like, prior to that, it was, oh, why you should wear a mask, why you should wear a mask. Now it's, oh, by the way, did you know that masks increase the incidence of plague, tooth decay, and gingivitis. Mm. Did you know that? Well, of course, most of us knew that, but they never told us that until after July the 19th. Masks can also increase the risk of tooth decay and gum infections. Well, surprise, surprise. Who knew that, eh? A dry mouth can cause increased levels of plaque. These bugs produce volatile sulfur compounds, which lead to halitosis. So, yeah, oh, why you should not wear a mask now coming. Now that's beginning to come out. So maybe, maybe there is hope. Maybe there is hope. Maybe there is hope. And certainly the Daily Telegraph has uh, always got columnists telling us what a bad idea lockdown is. But unfortunately, nothing changes. Alison Pearson, though, who's, who's done a yeoman's work in uh, exposing what's going on and, and who writes for the Daily Telegraph, she said this, and I think it's quite right. It's our patriotic duty to live as freely and boldly as we can. It's our patriotic duty. Those who are trying to postpone normal life indefinitely are the selfish and irresponsible ones. I reckon it's our patriotic duty to live as freely and boldly as we can. Ironically, that's what it will take to keep people safe. And isn't that so true and one of the great things about the British character was our courage 
it was our love of liberty, often individual liberty as well. Well, all of these things have been called into question in the last 18 months. And so maybe it is a time now for us to get back to that, to get back to those principles that the British hold dear. Britons never, never, never shall be slaves as Alison patriotic duty to live as freely as we can in the circumstances, even though often the might of the state is against us. If we can, in our own way, stand up for freedom and live as freely as we can. Good for her for saying that. Good for her for saying that. Somebody asked him, where can I get that T-shirt you're wearing, Alistair? This is a Force for Good T-shirt. Um, this is, uh, you get it along with other T-shirts at our Teespring store, which is our store for our T-shirts and hoodies. And we've got a range on there, some of them saying Scottish and British, Welsh and British, British Ulster, English and British, Royal Scots, Proud to be British. Loads of good patriotic stuff up there on our Teespring store. Please do, please do uh, check that one out. Please do check that out. A follow-up, a follow-up to uh, something that we spoke about two weeks ago. And I just want to get this in so that we can put up the link. Um, I did a big half hour about two weeks ago talking about wokeism in Canada and about the terrible desecration of the British statues that were pulled down. And I explained the, I explained a lot about that. That's, we cut that down into a 20 minute section, which is on YouTube, which we'll put up the link to for those who want to revisit it. But since I've spoke about that, uh, several good articles have really um, have appeared. Um, one of them, which I'll put up on our Facebook page tonight, uh, Canada is the world's first woke nation. Uh, we'll put that up on our Facebook page tonight. And that explains very briefly how Canada has come to the situation that it was in. And he traces it from when Canada left, uh, essentially left the British Empire in the 1950s. And the the Britishness of Canada um, fell behind to a new um, identity a new sort of multicultural identity that was promoted, probably promoted largely, although he doesn't say this here, by, by the, the French-Canadian side of things, especially the left liberal prime minister, Perry, Pierre Trudeau, who enshrined the so-called Multiculturalism Act into law in 1971. And this chap, Eric Kaufman, who's writing in the Sunday Telegraph, basically traces Canada's modern politically correct ills to that defining moment and I'm no doubt he's correct in that and then another article which we'll put up just now which we've got the link to is six things the media got wrong about the graves found near residential schools and this is a tremendous expose of the lies actually and misrepresentations of the mainstream media because when I was hearing about all these so-called mass graves being discovered, I thought to myself, you know, there's something fishy going on here. And in fact, this article explains the six, six things at least which are very fishy about the stories and how in fact they were misrepresented and how in many cases these were simply cemeteries that had fallen into disrepair and that they were unmarked because the wooden crosses, which was the local way that the local culture uh, remembered them, the wooden crosses had in fact just rotted, and hence the graves were unmarked. All of that's in here, uh, a really good expose. We'll put the link up to that as well. And then another article from, from Caton to Kamloops, which again addresses many of the same things, but helps to widen out what I was talking about two weeks ago as far as the Canadian situation is concerned because it is very important because it's about the British world being attacked unfairly and so 
you know, we're concerned here about the British Union, but we're also concerned about the British world of which Canada is still a part, thank God, and long may she remain so. Please do share this video, folks, um, if you can. Please retweet it. If you retweet us with a positive comment, then we can retweet you to 26,000 people. Ah, Tommy Scott just reminds us, buy the wee book, as everyone knows. I highly recommend it. Full of good information. There we go. Let's get a screenshot of that, and we'll use that to, to sell the wee book. But that's on our website as well. So please do, uh, we'll put the link up there. Please do buy that because we sell several of these each week. They're only a fiver. And um, that includes postage anywhere in the United Kingdom. So a great wee read. And, oh, I've just remembered something vital that I have to tell you. I have to sit down and I have to dedicate myself to writing this 36-page magazine. Okay, it has to come out by the end of the summer beginning of autumn and it's quite a big task it's going to be called do more together and it's going to be a 36 page magazine about policies to keep the uk together now in order to to write that i need a three-week stretch where i can sit down and do that so what that means is it's holiday season so this program is going to take a two-week break we're not going to be broadcasting next Wednesday, which will be the 28th, and we're not going to be broadcasting the next Wednesday, which is the 4th of August. But we will be back with our 29th programme on the 11th of August. Now, everything else will continue at A Force for Good as normal. We'll be continuing to publish every day on our TikTok and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram pages. And thank you to the team that does that. But we won't be doing this program uh, on the next two Wednesdays. And each of those Wednesdays, we'll put up a quick message just reminding people that we're not broadcasting that day. But we do need to take some time out of this broadcasting work in order to concentrate on the written work for this magazine. The only way that I can do that, the only way I can get my brain in the zone is to sit down and do that without the, the program on the Wednesday. So that will be a two-week break of broadcasting this program, but we'll still be doing everything else as we normally do on our Facebook pages. So folks, that's just a wee heads up. And this is the time of holidays anyway, isn't it? So so um, that's that's just to to tell you about that. So thank you, Tommy from the AFF team, Catherine's, I'm sorry, Catherine, but we will be back, we will be back on the 11th, and of course we'll be broadcast, we'll be doing our usual thing anyway, um, Bill can't, can't wait that long, I'm sorry, I'm sorry Bill, it's, we'll return with a great show, and we'll return with basically our, our magazine uh, written, and it'll just be a matter of designing it and printing it, which is, is an easy job for our graphic designer. And we do have a great team here, and thank you to everybody behind this page today, our Facebook team, and thank you to um, our YouTube team, and TikTok as well. Okay, we've over 610 followers now, so please do, um, we'll put up the TikTok link. If you're on TikTok, please do follow that. And also remember, this program will be a turned into a podcast as well which is on our program do you know we do so much here it's absolutely incredible how much we do and how much our amazing team does and our podcasts are so professional we just rip the audio from this we shorten it down we take out all the extra extraneous stuff uh, and we have a, a great person who does the podcasts at such a professional level and they go on to our web page forceforgood.uk Twigman says, can't wait for the magazine. Love the wee book for the union. Very well written and put together. Thanks very much, Twigman. And um, it's going to be a, a magazine which will be just like a book, as it were. You know, you, it, it'll be um, it'll be like a summer special. You know, back in the 70s, you used to get a Beano summer special 
or a uh, dandy summer special. This is like a Union Heart summer special, but it will be 36 pages, full colour. It's going to be absolutely amazing, so I need to concentrate in the next two to three weeks, three weeks writing that, and we'll be back on the 11th. Alan, the magazine is occasional. The We've already produced three issues uh, in the last two years, and so this will be our fourth issue. And so it's just occasional. We we tried to to keep it down to like, can we do it every quarter? But we couldn't actually. So it's just when it comes out, it comes out, and it's at least one a year, usually two a year. Um, and the one coming out in autumn will be the fourth one. And if you are a union supporter, which is to say, if you if one is supporting us with a donation monthly, then you'll be entitled to ask for you're entitled to ask for the Union Hearts free of charge and you'll get the 36 page one free of charge as well um, if you're a, a union supporter thank you very much to everybody who came along um, we're going to be back then on the 11th of August thank you very much to you all for watching please share the broadcast and we will see you on the 11th of August. We're going to be on Facebook every day as usual, but we'll have the program back on Wednesday, the 11th of August. So folks, it just remains for me to say, God bless the United Kingdom and God save the Queen. See you soon.